Welcome to Metamagics. This is the character build series where we build a character from level one up that has a specific focus on either a set of mechanics, a kind of archetype, or a specific kind of flavor that we're going for. And we build them in the strongest, most efficient way that we can. We'll be talking about the choices we make level by level and some of the numbers that are involved. This series can serve you as either a place to get inspiration from, if you're new to the game, this could serve as a path that you can easily follow as you learn about all the rest of the game. Or this could be a jumping off point for you to then take and put your own spin on it and make changes to the build. For consistency's sake, we use a 27 point point buy for abilities, and we only use published Wizards of the Coast content. Today, we're going into a playstyle that is another personal favorite of mine the Infiltrator of a Thousand Faces. This build allows us to sneak in right under people's noses, talk you and your party out of situations when you need to, wind and sneak your way to where you want to go, and be able to take out high value targets in a quick, sudden burst of damage, and then sneak away without giving a hint to who you are or that you were even there. Some expectations going into this. You need to be in a group that thinks and plays more practically, pragmatically, and they don't hold on to new player dogmas like never split the party. Also, need to be okay with either getting killed because you went in too deep, having to turn around just before your opportunity to do your thing is there because you're in a little too deep, or you need to be okay with, at the very least, getting captured and jailed when you do get caught. As with most charisma builds, I will warn you, not all DMs can give you the game you need for this kind of a character. You can run into some DM's limits with this kind of a build, especially if they're newer. If you have a DM that can go as deep as any player wants to go in a specific thing, and gives their players opportunities to do their thing, then this is a really fun build that will have you on the edge of your seat and the rest of your party on the edge of their seats the entire time. We should be raising the bars on our DMs, don't limit your playstyle to fit inside of their limits, but rather push them outside of their limits so that all of us can grow. And as a community, we have a more complex understanding of this great game. This build really shines inside of urban areas uh, with more complex NPCs who have leadership structures, and hierarchies, you can really excel inside of political games, or heist thief campaigns, or an Ocean's Eleven style of game. This is not a maximum damage build. This is a maximum infiltration build. Having the ability to drop a target in one massive hit is immensely useful, but it is not the keystone, but rather another tool for us to then go infiltrate even further even deeper into wherever we need to go and remain undercover as long as possible. There will, however, be damage reports on our assassination turns to keep in mind so that we know about what size of enemy we can take down in a turn or two when we need to. Now, onto the build. So, the race, this build is dependent upon being a changeling. And that's a fantastic race to build around, regardless. For the Changeling, we're going to get a plus two to our Charisma, awesome, and plus one to any other ability, which we're going to choose Constitution, just so that we can stay alive a little longer. With Changeling, we get Changeling Instincts, we gain proficiency in two of the following skills, Deception, Insight, Intimidation, or Persuasion. We get common in two other languages, and then most importantly, we get shape changer. As an action, you can change your appearance and your voice. You determine the specifics of the changes, including your coloration, hair length, sex, and gender. You can also adjust your height and weight, but not so much that it changes your size category. You can't duplicate the appearance of a creature you've never seen before. Even though you may change yourself to look just like another race, you don't get any of the statistic changes. So you can look like an elf, but you're still not immune to sleep effects, like an elf would be. And you can make yourself appear as another 
race as long as it's still humanoid and it still, you know, looks kind of like you. Uh, whether that's bipedal, has two arms, that sort of a thing. Uh, on top of that, your clothing and equipment aren't changed either by this train. But you do stay in this new form until you use an action to change form into something else, or revert to your true form, or you die. It is a permanent change until you decide to change it. Unlike other editions of D&D where this was just a disguise and had a slight chance of being seen through, rules is written in 5e. There is no perception check or save to determine that you are a shape changer in a form. You just become a new form, indiscernible from an original. Amazing. Very powerful. Or our abilities, using the 27 point point by um, and being a charisma character this means we want to max out charisma so our point by is 8 strength 14 dex 15 constitution 8 intelligence 10 wisdom 15 charisma with racial adjustments thrown in our charisma bumps up to a 17 and our constitution bumps up to a 16 so we got minus 1 plus two, plus three, minus one, zero, plus three. Level one, going in a rogue, simply because of expertise. Make sure that you spend enough money or you take a loadout that gives you a rapier. This weapon will be key to the entire build moving forward and hopefully you can replace the rapier with a magical rapier as soon as possible. Get one that does different types of damage as well as the regular weapon damage moving forward. Keep your eye out. Our damage potential is very decent with the plus one d6 on our sneak attacks. We also get a bunch of skills and we're gonna choose deception, perception, investigation, and stealth to be proficient in. We're also going to be proficient in insight and persuasion from our changeling instincts feature. And then with the rogue expertise, we're going to double our proficiencies in deception and in stealth. Probably the two things we're gonna be using the most. We are a very capable sneaky sneak already at level one. Level two, rogue two, we get cunning action, move, hide, disengage as a bonus action. Just better action economy, more useful, a little more slippery. Level three, sneak attack goes up by another d6, and we choose our rogue subclass, where we are going to choose the assassin. With the assassin, we get a new feature called assassinate. We get advantage on all attacks versus creatures that haven't taken a turn in combat yet. All hits are criticals on those creatures who haven't taken a turn yet. So, damage report number one. Moving forward, we're going to assume you hit with everything you have because your target should be helpless, uh, unsuspecting, or otherwise just an easy target to hit. This will be average damage based on the most probable numbers to count. So at level three, on our assassination round, we will deal 1d8 from our rapier plus 2d6 from our sneak attack. It will be a critical hit, so all three of those dice are doubled. So we will roll 2d8 plus 4d6, then add two for our dex, and our average damage at level three on our assassination turn should be between 23 and 27 damage. Very considerable. Level four, another level in rogue. We get an ability score increase and we're going to pick up a feat. The feat we're going to take is actor. Now remember, we're an infiltration build, not a damage maximizing build. Actor is key to this build. We will have advantage on deception and performance 
to pass ourselves off as someone else. We can also mimic the speech of another person or the sounds made by another creature. As long as we can hear and study this creature and its sounds for one minute. The person you mimic to gets an insight check versus your deception to reveal if it's mimicry or if they think it's genuine. This is an absolute must when we are imitating and impersonating other people to infiltrate groups and societies. If you need to sneak in under the nose as one of their own, you need to pretend to be the new guard that they hired to steal the jewel in a museum. If you are the busboy who is taking food inside of the castle, the actor feat puts you into a another tier. You can, with a high enough deception, just become other people, and they will be none the wiser. A key feat to have for any Ocean's Eleven type party. Uh, you can also have studied many, many, many people's voices over a 15 minute period where there's a lot of people. Let's say a dinner party, walking through the market, uh, or being the busboy inside of a castle, just hearing people talk from the other side of a door. This, in combination with shape changing and something like detect thoughts or modify memory, allow you to completely alter your relationship with people permanently and become someone else to them. You can assassinate someone after you've studied them for one minute to perfectly mimic them, and you can perfectly alter yourself physically to become them permanently. These two abilities together are immensely powerful and just ripe for creative fuckery, and I love it. Shape Changer and Actor are what really make this build shine. So at level 5, we're going to take a level in Warlock, and we're going to be a Hexblade Warlock. Our proficiency increases to a plus 3, because we're level 5. Uh, we gain Packed Magic. Cantrips, we're going to pick Booming Blade and Eldritch Blast. Booming Blade being vital to the rest of this build, and Eldritch Blast just being one of the best cantrips. First level spells we're going to learn, Charm Person, super useful, and Wrathful Smite, useful until we get Hex. As a Hexblade, we become a Hex Warrior, where we are proficient in medium armor, shields, and martial weapons. We also learn Hexblade's Curse. As a bonus action, choose a target within 30 feet. They become cursed for one minute. During that curse, you can add your proficiency bonus to damage on that target. You will crit between a 19 and 20 on them as well. And if that target dies, you gain HP equal to your charisma modifier, four, plus your warlock levels, one. Not bad. Damage report time. So, here is how our assassination rounds will start to unfold. There's a little bit of setup to get everything online, but it should be able to be done one turn before you strike the blow. And rules as written, nothing we do should make a sound. Nothing in that setup round should give you away, and you should be able to remain hidden, and combat should not initiate until you make that attack. Rules as written. Running into some DM's limits, that may not be the case, and this is why we have the caveat at the beginning. So, our assassination round. You find your target. You curse them with Hexblade's curse. They should not be aware that they are cursed. They do not have a feeling. They do not hear something. Nothing changes in their life, whether they are cursed or not by your curse, until you attack them. You cast Wrathful Smite. You walk in make a booming blade attack with wrathful smite still active you will on a critical hit have 1d8 from your rapier 2d6 from your sneak attack and 1d8 from your booming blade as well as 1d6 from your wrathful smite all of those dice get doubled to a grand total of 4d8 plus 66 damage plus three from charisma and plus three from your proficiency so 48 plus 66 plus 6. And then they take another 2d8 if they move 5 feet away from you during their turn. Now, this damage curve is very wide. 
and we're going to keep track of numbers occurring at a 3% probability and up. Meaning our average damage, things that are 3% likely or more, will be anywhere between 37 and 53 damage before booming. And if they decide to move 5 feet during their turn, our damage will be between 46 and 62 damage with booming. You're going to take out any normal creature that's level 7 or lower that isn't a barbarian warlord or a dragon. Any king, queen, head of head of a guild, um, VIP, what what have you? Any other any of their guards should also fall between 46 and 62. Another key feature about rules is written. Booming blade does not say that it makes a sound. Now, it causes thunder damage, which you would assume has a sound component to it, like thunder. But it's not written that it makes a sound, where things like shatter and uh, thunderclap specifically say it makes a sound that can be heard from this amount of distance away. Booming Blade does not have that written in. It, is, it does not say that it makes a sound. Thus, when you cast Booming Blade, your DM would be kind of stepping on your toes to say that everyone rushes into the room after you kill someone with Booming Blade because they heard the Booming Blade. That's not necessarily the case. If they really want to catch you and not let you be the character that you want to be, they should come up with a much better reason than that. Level 6, we're going to take another level in Warlock. We get Eldritch Invocations, and we're going to pick Devil Sight, Repelling Blast. We also know another first level spell. We're going to choose Hex. But with Hex, we cannot both have Hex and Wrathful Smite up at the same time because they're both concentration spells. Level 7. We're going to take our third level in Warlock. We are going to swap out Repelling Blast for Improved Packed Weapon. We learn second level spells, and we are going to learn Darkness. Darkness is going to serve as a good plan B for us, because we can both see inside and out of this magical darkness that we can cast. We can use this darkness to envelop our target that we're trying to assassinate. Uh, it will be much harder for them to escape, and we can continue to attack them while they meander around aimlessly inside of darkness they cannot see in. Uh, it can also be used as like a smoke screen and help you get away, and it could be paired with ball bearings or caltrops or oil to help kind of make hazards on the battlefield. It's a very, very useful spell. It goes great with Devil Sight. We also get our Packed Boot. We're going to choose Packed the Blade. As an action, we can create a martial or simple melee weapon. We're going to be summoning anything we need, but it's going to be a rapier most of the time. This means we can go in somewhere and they can confiscate all of our weapons and take whatever they want and still be able to summon our weapon at any time. We are technically always armed with our favorite weapon all the time. Level 8. We are going to take our fourth level in Warlock. We're going to learn a new cantrip. We're going to choose Message. Immensely useful. And we're going to learn Invisibility as another second level spell. Having invisibility for 10 minutes is a godsend for us to get in and out of where we need to go. At 4th level, we also get an ability score increase, and we're going to choose to get a feat. We're going to choose Fate Touched, and we're going to bump our Charisma up by 1 to an 18, which gives us a plus 4. We're going to learn Misty Step, and we're going to learn a 1st level Divination or Enchantment spell, which is going to be Hex. Hex, again, we just learned it. We're picking up Hex again because we will almost always want to cast it on our assassination target and then have our other two Warlock slots open for whatever utility or uh, whatever we need it for. Level 9. We're going to take a 5th level in Warlock. Our proficiency is going to come up to a plus 4. We're going to learn 3rd level spells. And we're going to learn Fly. We're also going to get a third 
Eldritch Invocation. And we're going to swap out Improved Packed Weapon for One with Shadows. And we're going to pick up as our third invocation, Thirsting Blade. With Thirsting Blade, we pick up an extra attack when we use the attack action. One with Shadows allows us to go invisible inside of Shadows, as long as we don't move or take any actions. If we take out all of the light sources along a hallway or wherever we want to hide, we are invisible without having to cast invisibility. That is super useful and fairly powerful. At this level, level 9, we have fully grown into our role. And from here, we are just going to lean into assassination damage silliness. So, damage report for level 9. Our assassination round looks like this. We find our target. We summon our weapon. We Hexblade's curse the target. We cast Hex on the target. We walk up. We make a booming blade attack, triggering the first round of combat. We do a rapier, sneak attack, booming blade, and hex damage as a critical, which means those all get doubled. We do 6d8 plus 6d6 plus 8 damage on this critical hit. Then we do an additional 2d8 if they move 5 feet. The damage curve for these attacks is pretty wide due to the amount of dice that we're rolling and the variance between 1 and 8 on all those d8s and 1 and 6 on all those d6s. So we're going to keep track of all the numbers that now have a 2% probability and up when calculating our average. We do 48 to 64 damage. That is a 70% likely chance of being a number between 48 and 64 out of all outcomes for all of those dice being rolled. And if they move 5 feet, we'll on average do between 57 and 73 damage with booming. Level 10. We're going to dip in a fighter real quick. We're going to get a fighting style. We're going to choose dueling. We add 2 damage if we hit while wielding a single one-handed weapon, our rapier, which is great. It's going to add a little more additional damage on each hit, and it's going to raise our minimum threshold on our damage potentials for each hit. We also get Second Wind, which is just a good utility bonus action where we heal 1d10 plus our fighter levels every short rest. Super useful ability to just keep us in the fight. Level 11. Take a second level in Fighter. Our cantrips improve from being a level 11 character. Booming now does 2d8 on a hit, and an extra 3d8 if they move. And as a second level fighter, we get Action Surge. Maybe the best ability any class gets in the game. We can take an additional action on our turn, once per short rest. At this level, we have peaked. We are fully grown into our assassin role. We can infiltrate better than anybody, and at this point, our damage potential is greatly increased. So, let's take a look at our assassination round. As always, we're going to summon our weapon, Hexblade's Curse, and Hex our target, and we're going to start to walk up. We're going to make a Booming Blade attack on the next turn, and then we're going to take a second action with our Action Surge and make two more weapon strikes. Because of Thirsting Blade, when we take an attack action, we can make two attacks. Buckle in, because we're going to say a whole lot of numbers. On our first action, we do a d8 from our rapier, plus 2d6 sneak attack, plus 2d8 from our booming blade, plus 1d6 from our hex. All of those are doubled, because it's a critical hit. Then we also add 4 from our charisma, 4 from our proficiency, 2 from dueling. Second action, same turn. We're going to make two attacks with our rapier, two more d8, plus two more d6 from those two hitting. Those are also doubled, plus another four charisma, four charisma, four proficiency, four proficiency, two dual, two dual. This is a grand total of 10d8 plus 10d6 plus 30 before booming. 
So we're going to keep track of all the numbers that now have a 2% probability and up when calculating our average. And that's going to leave us with an average 99 to 121 damage before booming. If they move 5 feet on their turn, it is going to do between 112 damage and 135 damage with booming. There is a 77% chance of that average happening, otherwise you're going to have a more anomalous, less than 2% number come up. You can fairly reliably depend on a 77% chance. We're breaking, we're breaking triple digits now. 99, 100 damage to 121 damage on average in that first turn on your assassination is fantastic. You should be able to take out just about anything on that first turn. But from level 12 on, we're making strict numerical choices rather than the more intuitive, easily narrated choices we've been taking up to this point. Level 12. We're gonna take a level in Fighter, and we're gonna pick up the subclass Rune Knight. With Rune Knight, we get a few abilities, one of them being Giant Might. You grow to a large size, you get advantage on strength checks and saves, and once per turn, you deal an additional d6 in weapon damage. Similar to Sneak Attack. We also get Rune Carver, which is a long feature, and we're just going to skip to the points that matter for us. We're going to pick up the Fire Rune and the Stone Rune. The Fire Rune, uh, when we attack using a weapon, we can invoke the rune to summon fiery shackles that come out of the ground. The target takes an extra 2d6 fire damage, which will be doubled during a critical, and then they must succeed on a strength save or be restrained for a minute, which they also take 2d6 at the start of each of their turns during that. Stone rune. When a creature you see ends its turn within 30 feet of you, you can use your reaction to invoke the rune and force the creature to make a wisdom save. If it fails, the creature is charmed. While it's charmed, the creature has a speed of zero and is incapacitated, descending into a dreamy stupor. Both of these runes allow us to further incapacitate and trap our targets in place if we can't drop them in that first turn. Uh, while restrained, we have advantage on our attacks and they cannot flee. And while they are charmed and incapacitated, we also get advantage and they cannot flee or take actions. This should allow us to finish the job quickly and then get to making our escape. So, at level 12, here is how our assassination round should look like. We summon our weapon, we find our target, we grow in size, we hex blades curse them, we cast hex, choosing either strength or wisdom for them to get disadvantage on, we walk up, we make a booming blade attack, then we take a action surge to make a attack action with two more weapon strikes. Dice counting. First action, we get d8 from our rapier, 2d6 from sneak attack, 2d8 from booming blade, 1d6 from hex, 1d6 from size, 2d6 from the fire rune, plus four, plus four, plus two. All of those dice get doubled. On our action surge, we do another 2d8 from our rapier, another 2d6 from two hits with a hex, plus four plus four plus two, twice. That gives us a grand total of 10d8 plus 16d6 plus 30. Now, looking at all the numbers that have a 2% chance or higher of showing up, our average damage is between 119 to 143 damage before booming, and if they move 5 feet on their turn, our damage outcome is between 132 and 157 with booming. Like all our builds, we're going to expect the character's career is going to end where 90% of campaigns end, and they're not going to go past level 10 or 12. However, with this build, we're going to keep building it out and see where we end up at 20, so stick around if you're interested. Wrapping up though, this is a deadly build. Super sneaky, unopposed in disguise, infiltration, and just poses such a sudden threat, both 
in assassination attempts and just on the battlefield in general. You can pass off as any person you need to, mimic them perfectly, lie and deceive your way through defenses, and stealthily make your way to your target. These skills also serve us outside of infiltration missions too. Our surprise burst damage is our main weapon, so if we can stick to the front, uh, maybe sneak ahead of the party a little bit and get the drop on our enemies, uh, we can really pull our weight together. We should also absolutely take advantage of catching people off guard by playing dirty and shamelessly. Get people really close to you with their guard somewhat down and then reinitiate combat, you get another assassination attempt. Ask to negotiate. Ask for ceasefire and to talk things out. Double cross people. At, at all aspects, if you can stop combat for some amount of time, take advantage of that. This is everything I would want when I'm playing an assassin in the game, and I feel like this build particularly really excels at this archetype. If you like this build, like this video. It helps us grow, gives the algorithm something to look at, and it gives us more opportunities to make more builds in the future. If you would have gone in a different direction somewhere along the lines, tell us in the comments. If you have any questions, let me know, ask them below. We also stream D&D every Friday and frequently play other RPGs throughout the weekend. We try to get a new build out every week, so make sure to follow and subscribe so you can catch the new one when they come out. Let's get back to building this thing out. Level 13, we're going to do another level in Rune Knight so that we can get a feat. And for that feat, we're going to choose Piercer. Our dex is going to go up by 1 to a 15. It doesn't really matter yet, but it will later on. Once per turn, when you hit a creature with an attack that deals piercing damage, or rapier, you can re-roll one of those attacks damage dice, and then you have to use the new roll. We're going to have three attacks during our assassination turn. If you get a 1 or a 2 on any of those rapier damage dice, re-roll it. Chances are it's going to go up. And then when we score a critical hit with the piercer feet, we add an additional damage die that doesn't get doubled, that is added in later, but that it's still an extra d8, which is 3 on our assassination turn. So, at level 13, our assassination round, same order of operations, but now we add 3d8 um, from our piercing feet to the total. We also add 3 more damage because our proficiency went up on our 3 hits that we add our proficiency bonus for. So now we have a new grand total, 13d8 plus 16d6 plus 33 damage. The curve is starting to get real flat at this point, so from here on out we're going to look at all the numbers that have a 1% chance of showing up and higher, which gives us a new average of 130 to 165 before booming, and if they do move 5 feet, they're going to take between 143 and 179 damage on that assassination turn. Level 14. I'm gonna pop back to Rogue. We're finally gonna get our sneak attack up a little bit more. We're also gonna get Uncanny Dodge. So we have a new D6 to our sneak attack, which can only happen once per turn. The math doesn't go up a whole lot from here, uh, but we will go to 143 to 180 before booming, or 156 to 194 if they do move five feet away from us. You could kill a young red dragon by yourself on the first turn. It is not likely that you will, but it is not negligible at what a high percent chance you have of getting to a high enough number to kill the average 178 of a young red dragon at level 14. It's pretty impressive. Level 15, we're going to dip into Paladin. How you want to narratively reconcile that um, is up to you. How I would do it would be, we have this very strict order of operations before performing a kill. That is a lawful thing to do. It is not chaotic at all. We have a very strict code of things that we need to do. We're caring about being the most effective possible and not leaving things up to chance as best as we can. Those are all lawful traits. Your 
basically a paladin of death. When we take our level in paladin, we get divine sense. Pretty pointless at level 15. We also have lay on hands, which gives us a small pool of hit points uh, to recharge ourselves with. Level 16, we're going to take a second level in paladin. We get a new fighting style. I chose defense, but at this level, none of them are really going to affect things too, too much. More importantly, we get spell casting and divine smite. This is why we're here for paladin. All of our divine smite dice get doubled during critical hits. So with two first level spells, we can divine smite twice on our assassination turn. We can also use a warlock spell to divine smite on that third hit as well. So we get to add a whole bunch of d8. First level spell slots, when you use them for a divine smite, you add 2d8 to the damage. Everything above that adds an additional d8. So first level is 2d8, second level is 3d8, third level is 4d8, and so on. So let's take a look at these new numbers we've got. With divine smites now in the mix, our new assassination round has a whole bunch of new dice. On our first attack, we have a d8 from our rapier, 2d8 from Booming Blade, 4d8 from liquefying a warlock spell slot into our smite. We get 3d6 from our sneak attack, 1d6 from our hex, 1d6 from our size, 2d6 from our fire rune. All of that gets doubled. Then we add another d8 from piercer, and then plus 4 charisma, plus 5 proficiency, plus 2 dueling. Action surge. We do two more rapier attacks for 2d8, with two more d6 from our hex from hitting, and then we're going to liquefy both of our first level paladin spells for an additional 4d8 of smite damage. All of that gets doubled for being criticals. And we also add another 2d8 from our piercing feat, because we're getting criticals. We're going to add a d8 each time we hit with one, plus 4, plus 5, plus 2 twice. Grand total of 28 d8 plus 32 d6 plus 33 damage. With a 1% probability and up of numbers, our average is 202 to 242 before booming and 215 to 256 with booming. If we're going after dragons, we can if things go fairly well, we can kill an ancient dragon of anything that's not immune to fire in two turns by ourselves. That is, if we don't die, that is, if they make all of their legendary saves, and we can still stick into combat with them somehow. We can fly, we can teleport, we have a whole lot of ways to keep up with them and not let them get away. They do have blind sight, so sneaking up to them and getting past their 20-something passive perception is a challenge. A challenge, but not impossible by any means. Level 17, we're going to go into Sorcerer. We're going to become a Divine Soul Sorcerer. We're going to be a Sorcerer from here to 20. Our cantrips increase at level 17, so Booming Blade does 3d8 on a hit and 4d8 on a move now. We get Divine Magic, being able to choose from the Cleric and the Sorcerer list. And we also get Favored by the Gods, where once per short rest we get to add 2d4 to either a failed save or a missed attack. We add those 2d4 to see if we actually succeed instead of fail or miss. Cantrips, I chose Control Flames, Friends, Green Flame Blade, and Mold Earth. All very useful, and if you need something that's not Booming Blade, um, but still a good cantrip to use anyway, might as well just go with Green Flame. First level spells, I chose Catapult and Absorb Elements. Two just useful, useful spells. And Absorb Elements, if we do hit with the Absorbed Elemental Damage, will get doubled on a critical. It won't be during our assassination round, but it will double if there is a critical. Key thing to know. Level 18, Sorcerer 2. We're going to gain 
sorcery points. Not meta magic yet, but sorcery points. Uh, we're also going to learn Guiding Bolt, just to give us advantage to then add our sneak attack and whatnot. Level 19, Sorcerer 3, Sorcery points increase, we get Meta Magic. I'm going to choose Quicken Spell and Subtle Spell. Quickening allows us to double down on Booming Blade during our assassination turn by utilizing our bonus action to cast it again. And then Subtle Spell allows us to activate and cast things more surreptitiously without giving ourselves away right before setting up for our assassination turn. The second level spell I'm choosing is Spider Climb. It is very useful. And remember that all of these sorcerer spells can also be liquefied to put into Divine Smites from our Paladin abilities. Our final damage report. Our first action we do a D8 from our Rapier, 3 D8 from Booming Blade. We are going to liquefy a Warlock spell and do an additional 4 D8 for our Smite, plus 3 D6 from Sneak Attack, plus 2 D6 from Fire Rune, plus a D6 from being our size, plus a D6 from Hex. All of that is doubled. And we add a D8 from Piercer, plus 4 from Charisma, plus 5 from Proficiency, plus 2 from Dueling. On that first hit, we do 15d8 plus 14d6 plus 11. As a bonus action, we are going to quicken another Booming Blade attack. That's another d8 plus 3d8 plus 1d6 plus 2d8, because we're going to smite again using a Paladin spell. And then we're going to Action Surge. On our second action, we're going to make two weapon attacks for an additional 18d8 plus 4d6 plus 11. That is a grand total of 46d8 plus 20d6 plus 33 before booming. On average, that is between 287 and 333 damage before booming. If they do move 5 feet, we will do between 305 and 351 damage with Booming. And an absolute maximum damage with Booming of up to 553 damage. And that is if you roll maximum damage on all of your dice. Which is extremely rare, but a fun number to know about regardless. And then at level 20, we're gonna do one more level of Divine Soul Sorcerer. We get another spell to use for smites. We're gonna pick up another feat. And I chose Mobile, just to bump our decks up to a plus three. Makes us harder to hit. Um, allows us to move through difficult terrain. Allows us to move faster. And making a melee attack, regardless of if we hit or not, allows us to escape easier because we do not provoke attacks of opportunity from whatever we try to attack. A useful feat, nonetheless. There's definitely an argument to be made where you bump up decks by one and another skill by one as well. Or you pick another feat. Uh, it's level 20, it's your capstone. You do what you want from here. And we've completed the build. I want to thank you for sticking through the entire video. Uh, again, make sure to like, subscribe, comment. Tell me what you think about this. On our next build, we're going to do a favorite of mine um, that I saw on the interwebs and I decided to take it and see see what the potential is for it. I didn't see any specific builds, um, so apologies if I copied anything anyone else has done. This is just my take on it. Look forward to that and we will catch you on the next video. Thanks. <laughs>